This is the Comics Alternative, episode 287. Reviews of No Brow 10, Studio Dreams, Love and Rockets, volume 4, number 5, and Last Mountain, numbers 4 and 5. Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Comics Alternative. I'm Derek. And I'm Paul, and we're two guys with PhDs talking about comics. That's right. And on today's episode, we're going to be looking at three fascinating texts, arguably <laughs> four. Uh, we're going to begin with a unique one, No Brow 10, Studio Dreams. After that, we're going to look at the fifth issue of the latest incarnation of Love and Rockets. And then after that, we're going to look at a couple of issues of Dakota McFadzine's Last Mountain, his mini-comic. But before we get to that discussion, we want to let all of you know that this episode of the Comics Alternative is brought to you by those wonderful people at Discount Comic Book Service. Go to their website, dcbservice.com, for all of your comics pre-ordering needs. There, you're going to find all DC, Marvel, Image, and Dark Horse titles at 40% off of the cover price if you pre-order. For all of the other publishers, you'll find that those discounts can be anywhere from 20 to 35% off of the cover price. And every single month, you're going to find some unbelievable specials. Sometimes those specials could be as much as 45% off the cover price. Sometimes 50% off cover, but every now and again you can find discounts that are even more impressive than that. And speaking of that, let me tell you about some of those impressive discounts. Um, every month at DCBS you find these bundles where you can just get these, you know, <laughs> giant uh, lists of comics, this giant bundle of comics for, um, for incredible discounts. And this month there's a Valiant bundle that is... Uh, a 50% off discount. There's two Marvel bundles that are 50% uh, off discounts. And then in DC, there's uh, all kinds of bundles that are 45 and 50% off. And also a Jinx World bundle from by Brian Michael Bendis that's 50% off. And heck, there's even a DC Vertigo bundle with the three new DC Vertigo titles for 60% off the cover price, just $4.77. I mean, that's incredible. Where are you going to find discounts like that? So, I, know, I know. Jeez. <laughs> Jeez. So check it out at, at uh, dcbservice.com. That's right. <laughs> Go to Discount Comic Book Service, dcbservice.com. They will take care of all of your comics pre-ordering needs. And after you do get your titles there, please be sure to send them an email and tell them that the two guys with PhDs sent you. Yeah, please let them know for us, okay? Well, Paul, um, before we get into a discussion of this week's texts, let's uh, let's say a few words about some news from the weekend, yes. the winners of the 2018 Eisner Awards. That's right. Uh, this past weekend, if you are living in a hole uh, and don't know, the San Diego Comic-Con went on. So, you know, we're getting inundated with movie trailers and all kinds of exciting comics news. But uh, really, I love I love the uh, the the Eisner Award uh, ceremony. I always follow it on Twitter as people live tweet it. And, uh, you know, we I think there are really two big winners that everybody's talking about, and uh, both of them are monstrous. Uh, <laughs> one of them was monstrous, actually, and the other one was a favorite of, of yours and mine. Um, you know, uh, my favorite thing is Monsters right. uh, by Emil Ferris from Fanagraphics. And so, um, but, you know, of course, among a, a whole bunch of other winners. Yeah, yeah. I think, yeah, those are the two big winners of the awards this year. Mm -hmm. And the thing that's fascinated about Monstrous is that it it received attention not only from, I guess, the younger reader categories, you know, right. best publication for teens. And, you know, this yep. is something that you and Gwen discussed mm -hmm. on your episode, uh, you know, a number of weeks back. Uh, but it also won best continuing series and another a number of other awards. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Cover and then, art, uh, writer for Marjorie Liu, you know, co-winner co, co, co of the award. Right? Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, and, and very deserving, very deserving. Yes. And it, yeah. when I uh, <laughs> learned of all the awards... I uh, felt ashamed that I really haven't kept up with Monstrous. 
mm. like I uh, had had planned on. In fact, Monstrous <laughs> was something that and I can't remember who I reviewed it with. Mm. Um, mm. I know it wasn't Kunkka. Um, was it Gwen? I don't know. Anyway, mm. uh, we reviewed the first issue of Monstrous when it came mm. out. Mm. What? A little over two years ago, I think it was. Yeah, yeah. That uh, about oh right. no, no, it was Andy Wolverton. I know because mm. I think he, ha- I think he knew the artist uh, T- Takeda. Mm. Yeah, mm. he had had some kind of class with her at some point, and so oh. he specifically wanted to review that first issue. Ah, ah, yeah, she is amazing. Deserved for the, I think, two awards that went specifically to her. I think for cover art and. Uh, something else but um yeah that book really is amazing and uh on you know other side of the coin i, I have kept up with uh monstrous uh nia nia derek no i'm just kidding <laughs> <laughs> i have to say i've been a big fan and um just it it's just mind-blowing um b- both that and emil ferris is my favorite things <laughs> is monsters which you know for all their monster um affinity they're actually very very different books um you know <laughs> One, a um, manga-inflected fantasy world with the sort of horror overtones that really gets at a, um, you know, anti-colonialist, uh, you know, fantasy world. And another very grounded in, uh, you know, simple, uh, simple, but um, but really quite um, rich life, inner life of a young girl. You know, it's just very, t- the two different, very, very different comics that um, I'm kind of proud to show around to friends and say, these won the big award in comics. And this is pretty representative. In fact, all the winners, uh, the variety of the winners uh, was pretty representative of the diversity in comics now. And I mean, diversity in many respects from cultural to national to, to um, you know, styles and things like that. So it's a, I liked the winners. I liked the list of winners as always. There's going to be those categories, those, those things where you, you quibble a little bit, but um, overall I was really pleased with, uh, with who, who was recognized this night. Yeah, I, I feel the same. And I was especially excited about my favorite thing is monsters getting as much attention as it did, because, you know, as you pointed out for both of us, it was, you know, one of the best books of last year and right. uh, mm-hmm. well-deserving, you know, mm-hmm. another big takeaway, I think from this year's awards is mm-hmm. the amount of attention that the mainstream received, especially mm-hmm. Marvel. Um, mm-hmm. Like for instance, best new series, Black Bolt, uh, hmm. best limited series, Black Panther, World of Wakanda. Hmm. I, I just think that the mainstream, and again, hmm. especially Marvel, did come away with a little more attention this year than they have in the past. Because one of the things that I hear from from you know, some comics fans is, mm. you know, well, with the Eisners, I don't recognize most of the titles there. Uh, mm. The mainstream really doesn't get much attention, but it did. It did, although I wonder if for some of those fans who <laughs> would complain about that, those particular titles aren't ones that jump out at them as their favorites. Um, I, I think Black Bolt was quite popular, and mm-hmm. um, writer Solomon, Saladin Ahmed has been, you know, making waves. Um and I, I actually, I loved both of those series. They were among my favorite series uh, uh, in the superhero worlds. Um, and then Tanahasi Coates and Alita Mart- Martinez and, and Roxanne Gay on on uh, Black Panther: World of Wakanda, which is a limited series. But I think both of those actually weren't the ones that saw the explosive sales or the you know tons of fanboy attention. Uh, they were more critically lauded uh, Marvel books. But yeah, definitely chalk it up, chalk a couple of wins up to Marvel and. Uh, Good on them for being savvy enough. Um, sometimes they're unsavvy about this stuff, but savvy enough to bring in the, the kinds of talents, uh, you know, that, that produce those two series. Uh, no, but I, I mean, I was also really excited for a lot of things that we've talked about on this podcast. Um, of course, the, the young readers categories that Gwen and I talked about, uh, including Good Night Planet by Liniers, uh, won the, the kids. Uh, and then, you know, we've also talked here about spinning, uh, from Tilly Walden and Boundless mm-hmm. by Jillian Tamaki. So, um, it's just further reassurance that a good way to anticipate what's going to be, uh, a, a big Eisner winner is to keep it locked here at the comics. The alternative. comics alternative. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> We're a barometer. In fact, what Kunkka used to, he used to phrase it as it's the comics alternative bump. And that's why a lot of these, uh, <laughs> Uh, creators and texts are getting attention is because we talk about them. Mm, yes. Or we'd like to think that. Yeah. 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 I, I, I like to think that. <laughs> yeah. One last observation, and then we mm-hmm. can move on, at least for me. Mm-hmm. Um, I was really excited that the winner of the best comics related book was How to Read Nancy mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. by Karasik and Newgarden. Sure. Yes. Well deserved. 
Yes, and uh, you had you had those the, those fellows on fellows, <laughs> those esteemed <laughs> scholars on <laughs> on the podcast. It was a great con- conversation, great episode. Actually, a couple of uh, times you got to chat about about how to read Nancy, including in your heroes panel. So um, that's right. Yeah, that's, I think a real significant work that uh, that those of us comics scholar nerds uh, enjoyed. So. <laughs> Paul, you want to go on to a discussion of this week's books? Let's do it. Okay. Now, the first one we're going to discuss is uh, No Brow 10 Studio Dreams, and this was released on June 5th, I believe. Mm -hmm. Um, (laughs) This is going to be a challenge to talk about, Hmm. I think, because it is largely a visual text. Yes. In fact... um, I would think with maybe a couple of minor exceptions, you would really, really be stretching it to call this a comic. Mm-hmm. In fact, I wouldn't even call it a comic. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What do you think? <laughs> yeah, I feel the same. I mean, I, I No Brow, um, I didn't know. I mean, I think No Brow is invested in artists, many of whom do comics. Mm-hmm. Um, but when I even when I think about, um, you know, it, the sort of the sort of success of a book like Hilda, a series like Hilda, and how then No Brow is sort of extending to um, be part of Hilda Publishing Pros now that it's a show that's showing up on Netflix and things like that. I, I think No Brow doesn't like to limit um, themselves to to comics, although certainly they're rooted there. Um, what we have is a book of really illustration, um, illustration from a lot of artists who have who do and have done comics. But um, I didn't mind that, to be honest. With no brow, that's, largely, I think. That's yeah. right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. That's right. Um, but I, I didn't mind it. Actually, I enjoyed the the sort of departure it was from our usual um, fare of looking at, you know, uh, narrative or, or informative uh, comics. So um, I, I would say that, yes, if if you... Are, if you are a, a purist about reading comics or us talking about comics here, then maybe No Brow 10 is going to feel like it's not for you. You're going to pick it up at your shop and go, wait a minute, this isn't comics. But I think if um, both the, you know, if I think if you are interested in art uh, co- and c- comics art in particular and comics artists and illustra- illustrators, um, I think this is a fascinating thing to, to check out. What it is, we should probably say that, is that right. each of the artists has basically a, 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 their own featured page. And so this is where it's not comics, but their own featured uh, two-page spread where they've drawn the studio of their dreams. And so we get to see, uh, you know, 100 plus pages of renditions of sort of imagined studio space. Um, and that's just kind of a fascinating project itself. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Now, um, to set the context, and I want to read a bit if I can, yeah. if you'll allow me this. Oh, yeah. Make a, do a couple of quotes. Mm-hmm. Uh, the very first part of this text is a foreword by the co-founder of No Brow, and that is Sam Author. And basically what he says uh, in uh, at, at one point in the foreword, he says, artists dream of their ideal workspaces the way most people dream of their ultimate holidays. <laughs> it might involve endless shelves of every color of paint, or it might be a more uh, more in the realm of giant jellyfish, forests of mushrooms, and <laughs> desert islands with skies full of rainbows. Mm. Is it realistic? Not really. But we're speaking of dreams here, and in our dreams, our jobs are inspiring, and we don't have time to do any tax returns or data entry, and we certainly don't have <laughs> anyone telling us what to do. Mm. Uh, um, and then uh, he goes on to describe what we find in this text, and he says basically um, – that this is a celebration of this is the I guess the ten year anniversary of No Brown, mm-hmm. and what they've done is they've invited a variety and a lot, <laughs> a <laughs> lot of creators to come up with their ideal workspace, their right. dream studio, and what we have as a result is a wide variety of illustrations of workspaces and some we have let's say a complete um 
I guess, visual representation of mm. what the whole studio would look like. With others, on the other hand, we have visuals that are perhaps, I guess you would call it more of a close-up where you have the artist at a desk mm. and you don't necessarily have a sense of the, uh, you know, the larger workspace. Mm. Some of these illustrations are more realistic. Mm -hmm. I think the majority are much more fantastical. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We have uh, different styles. We have creators from different regions. And in fact, I have to tell you, I only recognize the name of about two or three of these creators. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, what, what, what about you, Paul? Yeah, same. Uh, yeah, maybe two or three. Um, and probably I would guess they were the same ones. But enough of this art sent me to their websites, which you can see at the end of the book, you know, it's sort of a almost an index of all of these uh, illustrations. And so a lot of this art sent me to their websites to check out. And, you know, I did discover there that many of them do do comics. Some of them are just, you know, seem like they're just illustrators. Not just, but you know, <laughs> just only, only illustrators. Um, but some of the art was just so tantalizing that I just had to check out the other stuff. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't know many more than a couple of them. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. And, um, underscore the use of the word tantalizing that you mm. just used because the beauty of this mm. book, and this is something that, at least the way mm. I read it, quote unquote read or visually mm. read, um, I didn't do it in one mm -hmm. sitting. Or if I did, it's something that I did maybe the first time in a cursory right. manner, but then I kept coming back to it. And so this is the kind of book that you will return to, I think, multiple times, and you would want yes. to, mm. uh, not just to complete it, but just to get a sense of the visuals. Uh, each two-page spread, each contribution from mm. an artist, which is a two-page mm -hmm. spread, it's like a yeah. poster. And there's so much packed into the vast majority of these yeah. posters or these ideal yes. studios that, you know, you can just, you'll miss a lot the first time around, but go back and look at mm -hmm. it again. You can just luxuriate in the mm -hmm. visuals. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a few that probably we want to spotlight. Derek, I'd love to hear what mm -hmm. some of your favorites were, and I have a sort of list of my own, but just the kind of conception of the whole thing is um, – it it is this plunge into uh the way that people think about their workspace which is of course a mirror to how they think about their work and themselves as workers you know as artists as as cultural workers or whatever i i am obsessive about <laughs> about adjusting my workspace it's like my favorite pastime my wife always you know ribs mm. me about the fact that i always say i'm working and then I, she comes in the room and i'm rearranging furniture <laughs> but it's sort of like every new project <laughs> requires me to um re rearrange the workspace which is a kind of arrangement of my own mental space and i imagine that mm -hmm. for these artists as they think about the place where they work and also the sort of the sort of ideal or dream of the place where they work, it becomes a reflection of themselves in there and their work. Uh, and so uh, that as a kind of idea, as a conception and, and thinking about the workspace as this imaginary imaginarium of, you know, of these visual creative visual artists um, is just, a, 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 I think a very, very fun, um, you know, prompt, very fun uh, uh, little, a little um, project here. And, uh, and so it is fun to, to browse. Yeah, yeah. Now, you mentioned something about favorites, and I was thinking about that as I was going through the text right before mm -hmm. uh, we, we started to mm -hmm. record. I don't know if I want to phrase it in terms of mm -hmm. favorites, but, you know, notables, yeah. ones that I would like mm -hmm. to note um, that may or may not really resonate mm -hmm. with me, mm -hmm. but I think stand out for one reason okay. or another. Yeah, let's hear them. Now, yeah, now, now the first one is a contribution by Daniel Locke. And the reason I wanted to point this one out is because it's the only contribution that is a comic. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So here we have uh, apparently the David Locke himself <laughs> who is telling us about his workspace. Mm -hmm. And we have a series of panels where he basically says um, – he starts off by saying, I love my studio – uh, honestly, it's my favorite place where I'm most, you know, uh, looking to, and, and I'm not looking mm -hmm. to move, but then the rest of the comic, <laughs> uh, he goes through a series of other possibilities. And some of these are really wild mm -hmm. and fantastic mm -hmm. and strange. And then he comes back at the end to say, but you know where I work right now, I should keep mm -hmm. it because that's where I really love mm -hmm. to work. And, um, 
So that really stood mm-hmm, out to me. Mm-hmm. Especially because, I mean, not only is it great art and a fun story, but uh, it gets, it's the only comics contribution that we have in this mm, collection. Mm, yeah, yeah. Yeah, in the sense that it has panels um, and in word, word balloons yeah. uh, and s- yeah. sequential, you know, sequentialness, uh, which if you're sort of subscribing to the McLeod definition or other definitions of comics, that sequentiality is what makes it comics. Um, and, and I think people who who would want to push against that um, that definition might point to some other ones. I really like one by Bianca Bagnarelli, uh, which is uh, mm-hmm. maybe the seventh, seventh or so in the in the book. Um, yeah, and we definitely don't have right. page numbers, <laughs> no page numbers book, to so work it's... with here. But um, there's just this great simplicity. I mean, you know, it is actually a, a one of the more literal um, versions of drawing a workspace. And it really is sort of a sort of a sunset time of day, um, deep purples, and there's a simplicity in the colors and the design. It's basically like uh, uh, actually a, a drawing of what would be the outside of somebody's home, but there's a sunroom mm-hmm. kind of space that even as it's sort of um, dusk, or I, or I guess it could be dawn, uh, <laughs> two people are sitting in that workspace in this warm yellow light that emanates from it. And I, I do note that the composition, uh, Magnarelli is an Italian artist who's won, you know, Society of Illustrator Awards and drawn for New Yorker and, and New York Times and McSweeney's and stuff like that. But there's a composition that, that if you do think of the art in our eye instinctually going left to right, we go from sort of like the sky to the bottom right where there's a, there's these two artists in the space, or I guess a writer and an artist perhaps in the space. Mm-hmm. That gives it a feeling of it's not sequential, but it certainly is meant to sort of, you know, lead you from one place to another, as well as the lines and the slopes of the architecture leading you there. So it's sort of like from this um, this uh, beautiful sunset world, you know, you're drawn into the uh, the space of these two creators and feels, you know, like, uh, <laughs> by the way, Bianca Bagnarelli doesn't list, I haven't seen anywhere online where she she's listed as soon as she is listed as having a partner so the fact that there are two partner two partners here i wonder if it's a bit of a you know a dream for her to have that shared workspace yeah Mm. well speaking of simplicity Mm. another one that's quite impressive and even more stripped Mm. down is one of the last contributions in the collection Mm. and i'm sure i'm going to trip on this name zosia Mm -hmm. Mm. yeah that's an interesting one i like that one (laughs) Mm. Yes. And basically what you have here, this is, you know, uh, earlier I said something, you know, some of these are like more long mm-hmm. shot uh, studio spaces, you right. know, and the, 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 uh, the, the Bagarelli sure. is, I sure. think, one um, that uh, yep. of those. But you also have certain contributions that are like more yep. close ups yep. of an artist and you don't get a sense of their right. studio. And I think with this one, um, the <laughs> Desir Salska, um, you do have, ba- it's, it's very yes. simple and you have in essence, the artist sitting in a chair, holding a pencil or a pen, I guess. And then beside her is the easel with a light. And, uh, I think there's another work of hers on the floor and that's basically mm-hmm. it. Mm-hmm. And it's in a kind of a dark, she uses dark yes. colors and there's something, I, I don't know. You could argue either haunting mm-hmm. or soothing, or maybe both at the mm-hmm, same time, mm-hmm. uh, with her use of colors in this. Uh, po- mm-hmm. You know, I, I'm tempted to call these posters, <laughs> and in essence, they yeah. are. And I mean, any one of these, I would love to have a poster. Oh yeah, bank. or to have a studio space yourself that's populated with these. I mean, that would be super comics oh, alternative-y <laughs> for us to have this. Yeah, that would be awesome. No, yeah, I liked that one as well. Um, the art, her art style, uh, her, his, I'm not sure about the pronouns, forgive us for that. Zerzowska, I mean, that's my attempt at that name. Um, reminds me a little bit of Isabel Arsenal, who was a, a, a nomina- Eisner nominated artist of Louis Undercover. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, I really like that one. Speaking of these ones that are more close ups, I also liked one by Shannon Wright, um, which is a sort of, um, maybe 10 pages before or so. Um, but uh, it's the one where it's close up of her and, and really, she's drawing on what looks to be a, maybe a tablet um, or like a, a yeah a device, maybe a, a, um, a digital art, art tablet. But uh, is draw- she's drawing a little girl and there's a rainbow sort of emanating from her pen. 
And, uh, and that was one of those, <laughs> um, close up oh, ones yeah, that I really, yeah. really enjoyed. Uh, right is another Society of Illustrators award winner. And so, yeah, that's, that's a really nice piece. Just the sense that like, as I draw and he, you know, her studio isn't decked out, but she's beside a window and her imagination is on this, uh, this little girl and the sort of rainbow that goes into her creation, which is really nice. Yeah. Yeah. One that I thought was notable is a contribution by Rebecca Crane. Mm-hmm. Mm. And it is one of those that is the least fantastic mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Of, of the collection. And basically, um, Rebecca Crane's ideal yeah. or dream studio space is yes. a cafe. And, <laughs> and so mm-hmm. this this is uh, a picture of her sitting at a table, and then all around her are people talking, ordering yeah. drinks. And uh, I just thought that that was really wonderful. Yes. Also, the art in this one is more realistic mm-hmm. than the art in uh, most of yeah the less areas. abstract more more familiar to car- cartooning yeah yes mm-hmm. yeah less yeah, abstract yeah yeah, yes. yeah yeah no yeah i mean we could i could go on and on. as i'm flipping i'm just like this sally deng one which is like this beautiful echoes of a- asian art and then maybe one of the familiar names for both of us dustin harbins I've got these trees oh, that's and a, a bird one, yeah. house, uh, sorry birds in a tree house <laughs> and they're cartooning and drinking coffee you know it's this great like sense of balance um use of space but you know, they, they all kind of make me think that one thing about this project of one topic, but many artists, you know, many, many conceptions is that it really allows mm-hmm. comparisons. You really get to like, this is a great book to hand somebody who's thinking about art, even comics art. And to say, like, think about the very, the various dimensions of contrast here, you know, in space and color and medium texture and things like that. So th- there's just like, um, there's just, it's, it's really fun to kind of compare and uh, these as a way of thinking about what's, di- what are differences in style and how do they, you know, how do they manifest on the page? So, yeah. Yeah. Um, there are a couple that really stand out that give us this sense of, um, how do I put this? It's, it's kind of, you get a fuller kind of a side view, a mm-hmm. cutaway of a mm-hmm. studio mm-hmm. and you get a sense of where various things are. And one of those is by Steve Scott. Okay you know, toward the very okay. end. And you, we even get an index about where oh, the various um, yeah. uh, rooms mm, are. Mm. And then a similar one is by Ben Newman. And basically what we have here, his studio space is like, I guess his, his <laughs> head. And inside of his head are all these different yes. rooms. And in each room, you have different things or can do uh, different activities. Yeah. Yeah. yeah the, the ones that imagine different spaces, uh, which I think you're talking about, this, these cutaways. And even ones that are – there are certain ones that are just like super crowded with things. I give, give the mm-hmm. sense of a kind of like um, chaotic um, but – but purposefulness of like, this is all the craziness going on in my head, all the activity, these little like spaces of, of creative activity going on in my, in my head or in my space. And, and that's a fun thing too. And to see what the, some of those specific things are, you know, and how they think about the mm. many rooms of their, their own mind. <laughs> it's, a, it's a fun, yeah, it's a fun part of it. So. Mm. Right. Uh, another one that stands out for me is uh, one of the earlier ones. I think it's the third Alex mm-hmm. Deacon. And this is a studio space that looks like it comes from a fantasy world that could be in a, in a children's yeah. book. Yeah. Oh, and I, and I love the illustrations. Yeah, it's absolutely gorgeous. Uh, yeah, and it has kind of a pinkish brown. That's right, hue. like an old children's book. Uh, and yeah. a frog king, I guess, and uh, you know, or something like that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's a that's a gorgeous one. Yeah, I mean, really, we we were sort of at a loss initially to know how to talk about these, but really, you could you could spend a lot of time talking about. Uh, any of these. And, um, and so again, I feel like there's going to be people who are, um, stri- strict narrative lovers who are going to, uh, you know, um, bulk, uh, balk at this, this, the idea of, of having this as comics. But hey, you guys are supposed to talk about comics. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Save your grumpy emails for somebody else because, uh, I think anybody who has any appreciation for visual art is going to, um, find this really captivating book. <laughs> Paul, do you want to move on to the next work we're going to be discussing? For yeah, this week? sounds good. One of our favorites, yep. the Hernandez brothers, Gilbert and Jaime, and this is Love and Rockets, Volume Four, Issue Number Five. And you know, it's a it's a matter of policy. It's unwritten that on the comics alternative, every time 
the Hernandez brothers, either together or separately, publish something, we must discuss it on the show. <laughs> and actually, it's kind of a pleasure because now this new volume, since you know they wrapped up new stories and stuff, the new stories books, which are not new stories anymore, uh, is are coming to us sort of quarterly now, uh, almost quarterly that we're getting these now. Um, I think they come out every uh, three, three times, times a, year. a year. I think it's every Got four it. months. Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And 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 that's great because I I love the size of the chunk that we get. You know, uh, this issue mm-hmm. in particular um, because we're wrapping up sort of Jaime's three year um, you know story of this reunion of of the the the, the locas and the, the band which began in new that's stories. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. So these stories are crossing over. Uh, and we just get a little bit, I think, um, Gil- it seems like Gilbert's been busy with lots of different projects, including, you know, Assassinistas and stuff like that. Um, so a little bit less Gilbert, but we, we, you know, we get just, um, these are, these bits that we get, this, the, the, the pieces that we get today, uh, in this, in this issue, oh, just really got, you know, got hit, hit me right in the heart. I don't know how you felt about it, if this felt special to you, but. Yeah, no, it it did. And, uh, you know, the last time we – or the last Mm -hmm. issue, uh, number four that we discussed, uh, Gwen and I did this back in January of this year. So uh, it doesn't seem that long ago, but (laughs) I guess it has been. Um, And and this issue came out actually back in May, and we're just now getting around to discussing it. But discuss it, we must. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And so basically, as, as you pointed out, what we have in this issue are, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, three basic narratives. There is the, is this how you see me (laughs) storyline? And that's what it's called in this issue. I don't believe in earlier issues of Love and Rockets with this story. And this is the one Mm -hmm. where the, um, you know, the Maggie Mm -hmm. and Hopi and their, their reunion, uh, back, you know, the Hopper's reunion. Uh, I don't think that it went by this name previously, mm. but in the back of the issue in the letters page, uh, the editor does state that they this this story will be collected and it will be called "This is how you This is how you mm-hmm, see me." Mm-hmm. Um, so there's the "This is how you see me" mm-hmm. storyline, which is again the Hopper's mm-hmm. reunion, uh, and then there is the. Uh, I guess along with this at the same time, uh, the story of Maggie and Hopi's youth uh, beginning in, at least in this issue in 1980. And then I guess moving ahead a couple of uh, several Mm. years to kind of contrast with the reunion Mm. story. And then Gilbert's big contribution in this issue comes in the, in the middle and it is the story Mm. Rosie, which is about Rosario, Mm -hmm. one of Fritz's Mm -hmm. daughters, Mm -hmm. And so this is yet another Fritz right. story. <laughs> For Fritz and her family. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I, the way I took um, the, the flashback stories is that it seems like throughout this, I guess what's going to be called Is This How You See Me? The um, present day, I guess, of um, Maggie and Hopi and, and revisiting uh, they and their friends, them and their friends is, is actually been, you know, um, juxtaposed with these, cu- these flashbacks throughout. Yeah. yeah. So I, I definitely I took those flashbacks as sort of purposefully, you know, lined up to moments in this uh, sort of you know reunion, reunion uh, uh, narrative. Um, and uh, but but you know they, f- yeah. It, there's a poignancy now that this is wrapping up. The whole thing has been kind of a beautiful revisiting of um, you know, and, and actually, and I think in this one, the he flashes back to 1980, as you said. Um, I stupidly was doing the math. I was like, how long ago was 1980? I was born in 1980. So I just, <laughs> my age basically. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, to think that, you know, really from 84, right? So we've had, um, this much time with these characters and, um, and they are where they are in the story, which, you know, those of you who've been following, or even if you haven't, actually, this is a good issue for people who haven't been following it to be able to jump in. Cause it's, you know, if you know a little bit about the, the world, um, that's plenty for you to enjoy this. Um, but just to see these characters, um, you know, Hopi and Maggie that we have known and loved for so long at this place in their lives is, um, is just very, this is very moving to me. Actually, it was very like, wow, these are, humans that have you know like have gone through all these different transitions and and experiences and and that we've been able to go through with them and then the flashbacks just make that just sort of all the more poignant so i I think 1980 was sort of just the right time for for as a kind of um a reflection on their relationship 
Yeah, and I'm glad that you pointed out that this may be an issue for someone who is, if not unfamiliar with the world of the Hernandez brothers, then may may not know much mm-hmm. about it or hasn't visited this world or their worlds in quite a long time. One of the things that I usually do with um, every Love and Rockets mm-hmm. issue, and especially in preparing for the discussion <laughs> for the podcast, is I go back and I make sure to reread the previous several mm-hmm. issues and then read the right. new one. This time around, I decided I'm just going to read this latest mm. issue, number mm-hmm. five, and not go back and reread those previous mm. ones. And I thought that I may be a little lost. Mm. I wasn't mm-hmm. at mm-hmm. all. Uh, I mean, of course, there's part of this, is this how you see me storyline that I'm probably not remembering. Mm. But um, I could pretty much pick up where I left off uh, after issue number four earlier this year. Yeah, absolutely. Because, and you know, one thing about, so, so they're being followed by uh, I forgot his name. Manuel Miguel is it? You is it? Eugene? Yeah, sorry, Eugene. Yeah, and that is a kind of a continuation. I think from two issues back, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and then the even the flashback stories uh, with Porfirio is also kind of a, a you know has t- is touching back to some flashback stuff we had before. But none of that is essential. And I think that that is part of what this uh, ending is doing is that you know the cutting of of sort of time and space of of people's lives is um it's just a sense that we especially as we get older um experience our chronologies and and memories and you know it, it, it just not in a necessarily in a pure sequential way you know there's like this relevance of these older moments uh in these odd mm-hmm. times in our uh, you know in our you know more advanced years that um that uh yeah you just you just feel when you're reading this these stories together yeah mm-hmm. Yeah, and I do appreciate and enjoy those kind of flashback mm-hmm. stories where we get a younger Maggie and mm-hmm. Hopi, uh, especially in the I guess early earlier days of um, um, the barrio mm-hmm. and the presence of this character Dell, mm-hmm. um, uh, and and I like those. But to, I mean, the standout in this issue to mm-hmm. me is the wrap up of this is mm-hmm. how you see mm-hmm. me, uh, Jaime's. Yeah. story and it, it, the thing that is fascinating about this and I, I can't wait till it's collected yeah. next mm-hmm. year um is you know these guys Maggie Hopi and mm-hmm. others from uh the barrio they get together for a reunion mm-hmm. they have a good time and so it begins well enough <laughs> mm-hmm. but then as we see in I said issue number four and especially issue number five things turn I don't want to say mm-hmm. dark mm-hmm. but threatening. Mm-hmm. And especially when it comes to issues of gender identification and sexuality, mm-hmm. uh, because Maggie and Hopi, as they're being pursued, they're accused by more than one or two people of being lesbians. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Pejoratively. You know, in, yeah, in kind sure. of a condescending yeah, yeah, right. way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I, I think they're very – It's and even in their back and forth, they're – going back and forth about some very um very modern types of worries you know they're they're being chased mm-hmm. by Eugene uh who is a different kind of threat from the kinds of threats that they felt and faced when they were young and i think that's part of what you right. see in the contrast and then you know they're they're dealing with problems like not having um cell phone battery <laughs> that that works to get them out of situations <laughs> and then you know hope he's regretting some old loose words and neglected relationship you know uh mm-hmm. these are things that you worry about when you're at that when you're when you're when you've gone from locas to like viejas you know <laughs> like you're 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 getting to that um i i guess that that stage of those kinds of regrets and those kinds of threats um eugene is a funny thing to feel threatened by um and He's almost like this big lumbering golem sure. walking behind them. And he, and he, when we say that they're being chased right. by Eugene, like, he's not running chase. after them. He's just walking <laughs> right. behind them. And then in this issue, one of the things that's so funny is they go through a series of haze yeah. yeah. where, uh, you know, Maggie and Hopi <laughs> yell at him. It's like, hey, you know, as to get yeah. away. And he goes, hey, yeah. back. And then they, they, they respond with, hey, and he go, yells, hey, back. And so there's, there's a, you know, a page or two of just all of these right, hays. Right, right, right. Yeah. There's a lot of, there's a lot of hay being thrown <laughs> here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a weird kind of threatening, right? Compared to when they're young and they're hanging out with drug dealers, you know, and, and gangsters, you know? And I mean, I think, um, 
of course, the the most mortal danger is that um, Maggie trips and falls on her face, you know, at some point in the midst of, as you were mentioning, this confrontation with these young people who look like they should be, you know, hip and uh, and and cool, but they're actually sort of very unsafe, you know. And and so, there's, yeah, it's just the entire time that we spend with these two at this age, um, they're just voicing all these contemporary dilemmas, but it's not just sort of like two random <laughs> older people. Obviously it's people that, with whom we, we've had <laughs> these uh, many experiences and seen them through these many years. So um, yeah. Yeah. And we, yeah. And we talk about the threatening nature <laughs> of, you know, their, I guess the end of the reunion as they're mm-hmm. walking down the street at about what, three o'clock in the <laughs> yeah. morning, four o'clock, something like that. Like right. that. Um, yeah. This comes out in that scene that you referenced where Maggie falls and I don't want to give too much mm-hmm. away, mm-hmm. but we see in the panel where Maggie actually trips, the way that Jaime illustrates her, it looks as if she's crossing the street running, she falls, and she's twisting her right. ankle. Because if you look at her left mm-hmm. leg, the way that her foot is positioned, it's like, yeah, right. that's what happened. So they go um, – and you think, okay, so that's 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 the tread. You know, she's she can't walk anymore. They're going to be stuck. <laughs> Actually, it's something uh, much more comedic than that that happens to her. Mm-hmm. And so the the result of the fall falling is not a twisted ankle or a broken mm-hmm. leg. It's something else entirely. And I think that that's one way of kind of softening the threat yeah. that they face. And so it does have. Um, I don't know if you want to call it a happy ending <laughs> or at least a non-tragic ending. That's for certain. Yeah. I mean, I think if you wrap up, wrap in what happens at the end of this sort of um, middle of the night, a uh, little uh, detour or a little walk between the two of them and the flashback scene and really the last page at the grocery store with, uh, I forgot, D- Duffy or whomever. Um, Daffy, Daffy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and all the mentions along the way of Speedy and Ray and, you know, like mm. various touch points for people who've been following. Uh, it's, like I said, so poignant. Uh, <laughs> really, it's really kind of pulls a whole lot of these two characters' story um, together. And um, and I, I really liked page eight, uh, the sort of the bottom, the end of that flashback where, you know, a very young Maggie and, and, and Hopi are sort of... Um, they're sort of kissing and you see that one, one, one panel, the bottom middle where there's a side view of, of a side view of one and, and sort of a front view of the other, but they look like they could be one face, you know? And then this is very, that's iconic right. Yeah. Image. Yeah. Just I'm, and the way that they're dressed and the color of yes. their hair, they're almost inter- interchangeable. Exactly. And of course, when you, we just Visual. saw them older when they look quite different from each other, you know? It's yeah. just a beautiful kind of sense of the, the, you know, a life's evolution of these, these two humans. Um, I loved it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now I wouldn't expect this kind of these flashback stories that Jaime's been including in the in past several issues to be included in this. This is how you see me volume that will be coming out. Next you think so? Year. I wouldn't. I know. I don't mm. think so. Yeah, I. I mean, it, it would be interesting if it would be. I mean, I, I could. I don't care one mm-hmm. way or the other. I just wouldn't think so. I think that there's enough of enough of a story um, with you know the main storyline, the reunion, and the aftermath mm. uh, to make up a really nice volume. I don't know. I, I, it, it, th- there's about as much material here as was in Love Bungle. Yeah, which was collected. yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and collected in a similar way of of cutting through you know a lot of other stuff and making its own clean story. And yet, I mean, I feel like the ca- contrapuntal notes that um, these flashbacks add really are essential to the story. But yeah, I guess we'll see. <laughs> I, yeah, but I, but I, no, I agree yeah. with you. I do think that they're, they're important. And so I'm, I wouldn't think that he would include it, but who knows, who knows? if yeah. he does, I think that's yeah. wonderful. I'd, you know, I, now I, I'm saying it here and I may regret my words, <laughs> but I anticipate that when this is how you is, this is how you mm-hmm. see me comes. Or actually we should say, this is how you see me because it ends with a question mark. Um, when that comes out next mm-hmm. year, it probably will be one of my favorites of 2019. <laughs> I mentioned this before on the podcast, but um, I think I was more of a Gilbert fan when I was uh, younger. The older I get, for some reason, I, I just uh, gravitate toward Jaime more, you know. You know, and that's a great transition mm-hmm. into uh, Gilbert's contribution, mm-hmm. Rosie. Right. I was the same way. Mm-hmm. Um 
when I first started to read the Hernandez brothers, mm. I was much more into Gilbert and his mm. world than um, Jaime's. Mm. I, even though I loved mm-hmm. Jaime's, I think the thing that drew me into Gilbert was mm-hmm. Palomar. Right. right. I think since Palomar, and I include in Palomar even the part where um, they left and went into California, mm-hmm. they went into yeah. LA. Yeah. Um, where things shifted yeah. for me hmm. was where when uh, Gilbert started to emphasize more on mm-hmm, Fritz mm-hmm. and people and the whole uh, yeah LA scene, right? Yeah, right. Right. Well, well, you know, I mean, not so much Pipo because every now and again we'll see Pipo, and we should mention for the listeners who may not be aware, Pipo. I mean, Pipo was a char- one of his earliest right, characters, right? Right. Right. Um, Especially, you know, in in the earliest uh, Palomar stories, we see right. Pipo. She's a central component. We see her occasionally. I think we may have seen her last issue or maybe two issues mm. ago. I can't mm-hmm, remember. Mm-hmm. Um, a lover of, or mm-hmm. sometimes lover maybe, mm-hmm, of mm-hmm. Fritz's. Um, but when I talk about the Fritz stories, I mean pr- primarily Fritz, her mm-hmm, daughters, mm-hmm. Granddaughters, um, you know, out completely outside of what was going on with Luba mm-hmm. and the rest of the more quote unquote traditional Palomar. Yeah, crew. yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess my feelings about it, and as I said, you know, drifting towards Jaime, but I, I feel like I, I get a sense of what Gilbert's doing, and I don't mind it actually. I, I, th- I mean, in this, this um, issues, it does it actually in a very kind of tight, concise kind of way. Because we see Rosie and um, she's essentially, you know, she's staying with uh, with at Fritz's, but Fritz isn't there. And so what she's essentially doing is wandering around the mansion. And there's a vacuity to the, the giant. There's a lot of, you know, negative space in this. And there's a lot of like these vast um, uh, artifacts of, of her career that, you know, that Rosie's staring at with a kind of like, what is all this for? You know, there's an, this one panel in particular on page 17 where um, one of the, uh, I guess the servants is like, this is her new studio for making her own movies. And they walk, in, it's this gigantic empty space, you know? And mm-hmm. it's just this sense of like the emptiness of, of all the stuff that, um, you know, she has built off of her, you know, movie success or whatever her, Yeah. Now, okay, so you say that Fritz isn't here, but at the very beginning, um, Fritz and Baby are there, and and then along with Rosaria or Rosie. Um, in, in essence, what we have here is at the very beginning, Fritz and Baby and Rosie are at Fritz's place, and then Fritz and Baby are going to go do something, leaving – Rosie by herself. And then the rest of the comic is primarily her Rosie wandering around, looking at things, trying to figure out what to do and uh, watching movies, or at least one in particular by right. Fritz. And the this Fritz story, the, the movie, uh, intersperses Rosie wandering around Fritz's right. house. Yeah. And, and again, I had one, you know, I, I questioned as well, you know, do we have Fritz in this story? And at first I didn't think so because who seems to be Fritz because at one point Rosie addresses her as Fritz. Oh yeah. Yeah. No, I didn't mean um, Fritz wasn't present in the story, I think, but I think the whole story okay. hinges on her leaving. <laughs> right. And, right. And actually but, having, but, but her hair looks different though. I mean, she uh, looks uh-huh. younger than she should be right uh, here. Uh, uh, um, and and th- I think this underscores one of the challenges, yeah. I think is the best way of putting right. it of these Fritz stories is Especially over the past several years, we're dealing not only with Fritz, but Fritz's children and then Fritz substitutes. Right, right. <laughs> People who Min- want to be Fritz. And copy, copycat. Fritzes, yes. Yeah. And they, many of them seem to look very similar and it's hard to keep them apart. And in fact, I think Gilbert, if you're listening to this, and I'm sure he's not, <laughs> you know, it's time for you to come up with another one of your lists where we have a, you know, pan, oh, yeah. you know a page of, you know, who is who. <laughs> He does that really yeah, well. Yeah. But with the Fritz stories especially, God, we need this. Yeah. Uh, no, I, I – no, actually, she's uh, omnipresent. Fritz is omnipresent even when she – so very purposefully in, after the first two pages, you know, Fritz leaves the picture. But I, and I say that, you know, tongue-in-cheek because she's actually in pictures everywhere that um, that Rosie goes, you know, this va- vast mansion of, of images of Fritz uh, in various roles. And um, 
you know, so much of the Fritz story and Fritz and her copycats is about, you know, the body, especially the female body, especially the, uh, you know, certain kind of female body as it, uh, as, as it's sort of splashed on screens and really on, on pages and, um, and really whether or not uh, these various family members or women can can um, can find a kind of human connection or a sense of self um, apart from the, the the gaze of these um, all of these kinds of images and or or or, or whether they, they reclaim themselves in that way. You know, the interesting thing about the movie that we see inter inter spliced into this is that they say i forget who i think one of the servants says uh this is fritz's most critically successful movie and the whole time she's in a spacesuit where you can't see her body and i think that's you know part <laughs> yeah. of that, that statement too and so i just feel like rosie and that's why i say this was like a really concise for me you know um little bit little commentary on what these stories have been all, all along which is rosie's going around and, and she is observing the way that Fritz in her own home in, in its emptiness is on display over and over and over again. And in the end, just to slightly spoil it, you know, she's just kind of like, that I'm, I'm out, you know, like, <laughs> uh, no, no thanks. And, um, I think it's yeah. interesting. Yeah. And, you know, and the way that you put it, Fritz on display, mm -hmm. I think that that's the best way of summarizing this story. Mm -hmm, Rosie. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 So she, indeed she is everywhere, <laughs> but I know what you mean yeah. about, uh, you never know if you're actually looking at Fritz or, <laughs> Fritz alike. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Um, you know, getting back to the whole Fritz thing that mm. uh, Gilbert's been doing for the past number of mm. years, you know, I don't know. I've, I'm of two minds mm, of that. Mm, mm. On the one hand, and I think on a more intellectual level, I really appreciate what he's mm. doing. On the other hand, when it comes to the level of enjoyment, mm. maybe not as much. Mm, I mean, mm, I, I enjoy yeah. it, but I don't enjoy it in the same way that I enjoyed, let's say, Gilbert's earlier work. Yeah. But I don't expect him to do now what he had done years right. ago, decades yeah. ago. You know, artists That's change, right. they move on to different topics. And so, I, you know, I'm not going to be one of those who say, hey, give us more Palomar <laughs> stories. And once in a blue moon, sure. he does. But um, I don't know. I'm I'm fascinated more than anything mm. by the Fritz stories and, and where he's going. It could be confusing yeah. at times. It can be challenging at times in ways that the Palomar stories weren't as challenging. Yeah. 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 And actually this is so fitting. I didn't, it didn't even occur to me until now. I think that that is part of the point. There's so much in Palomar and in a, in a lot of other um, of, of Gilbert's stories throughout the run that you connect to and you relate to the smallness of the town and, you know, people who, have gone through all kinds of things and abuse and wondering and, and magic, you know, all kinds of things that are very, I think, tight. If, if, you know, they're very close, close to the skin, mm -hmm. but um, uh, there's a lot to the Fritz stories. That's more like latter day Elvis or latter day Kanye take whichever <laughs> comparison you you're warm, warmer to, uh, which is that they leave you cold because they're sort of like the, um, you know, once you've made it, once you're, once you've, whatever crossed that um that golden line into into success of some kind or, or or something then the emptiness that's there on the other side and so the title of this short story which i didn't even notice is as rosie in the first page it says rosie and you're right it's not about you and i i, I kind of <laughs> think that that's um that's supposed to be how Ro uh, what what fritz is saying to rosie as she's wandering around the house and going this is you're right it's not about me it's really about you this whole place is about you but um because of the the sort of um i don't know the the um, umbrella of celebrity that kind of cut shades all things um and I, I i feel a little bit like these stories are about a world that is very far removed from me you know i will never hang around with people of this <laughs> of this body type or or celebrity status and and i think you know i think gilbert's well i don't think there are people no, of that body true. type of fritz yeah. really but I, I just don't you know like this is about other people who are celebrities are not like us and uh and really kind of the emptiness of it so yeah so i i just think it's not meant to be warm to our hearts it's meant to comment on things that are actually instead splashed in front of our eyes all the time uh, and explore yes. that. So mm. any other words on love and rockets? Number five, uh, nothing except I love it. <laughs> yeah. It, it's, a, it's an incredible issue. Yeah. And again, I can't wait 
for next year's collected. This is how you yep. see me coming out. Yep. Okay, uh, the final text or texts that we're going to be looking at are by Dakota McFadzine, and these are issues number four and five of his mini comic, Last Mountain. Mm. And um, if you want to find out more about Dakota McFadzine, go to his website, and that is dakotamcfadzine.com, D A K. O T A M C F A D Z E A N dot com, <laughs> and it's it's a very simple page. But from there, you can go to his his Tumblr site, his Twitter account, contact information, and also shop. Now, we should mention that what we're discussing, you know, issues number four and five of Last Mountain, are sold mm. out. So you can't get them, which is unfortunate. But if you could find or uh, in some way or another get your hands on these issues, then uh, please mm-hmm. do. And, and previous issues of Last Mountain are also mm-hmm. sold out. Mm-hmm. So it's unfortunate. And, and we should mention that uh, – and I know we did at the top of the show. These are mini mm-hmm. comics, mm-hmm. right? So these are something that Dakota publishes himself. Mm-hmm. Now, he's been published by others in the past, and – um, I know that we've discussed some of his work uh, previously. We uh, discussed Don't Get Eaten by Anything, a collection of dailies, 2012 through 2013, mm-hmm. when we did a conundrum uh, spotlight. And then he has another book. I also believe it's by conundrum. Other Stories in the Horse You Rode In On. And we didn't discuss that mm-hmm. on the show, but that's another great collection. But I think both Don't Get Eaten by Anything and Other Stories in the Horse You Rode In On are great introductions to, to Dakota McFadzine. Mm-hmm. Also, Dakota, along with Andy Warner, edits the anthology Irene. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's been a while. I think yeah. uh, number six yeah. t- came out in 2016. Mm, that sounds about right. So we're due for... Yeah, we're due for another issue of Irene. Yeah, Andy Warner, Dakota McFadzine, let us know if there's more coming. Because yeah. that's actually where, that was yeah. my exposure. I haven't read the other uh, pieces. Of course, I've heard him on the podcast. Um, but uh, yeah, we interv- I interviewed mm-hmm. him uh, a number of years ago. Yeah, 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 it seems like a super nice guy. Um, and uh, but I hadn't I hadn't read um, Last Mountain one, two, or three, and uh, maybe you never will, <laughs> never will be able to unless they <laughs> they come back into press. They are mini comics, but they're very attractively printed as i you know as i'm looking at to know you're alive right now which is last mm-hmm. about number five we're talking about today i was reading it and my wife said is that a cd is that a cd co- you know is that a booklet or something like that so it's kind of that it's about the size of yeah, a CD. yeah 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 but uh but or a cd yeah, cover it yeah. looks great um yeah so okay so <laughs> this is going to be interesting how do we discuss last mountain number four Unlike Last Mountain number five, and as you mentioned, the title is To Know You're Alive. Mm-hmm. It has a title. Last Mountain number four does and doesn't have a title. <laughs> um, there is some kind of text at the very top, but it's in this indecipherable language that looks almost something like alien <laughs> you know, writing. And in fact, this is largely a silent mm-hmm. comic. Mm-hmm. And any text we get, even the information at the back about, you know, where to go to find out more information about Dakota, apparently, or or whatnot, Mm -hmm. uh, is in this language. And so it really is indecipherable uh, in terms of text. But with the visuals, uh, it's it's easier to read Mm -hmm. now. But even the visuals, (laughs) I mean, this is a wild story. Um, uh, You know, I think Dakota, he emailed me, uh, I don't know, a couple of weeks ago about this. And he called Last Mountain number four, the bear comic. (laughs) And the reason he called it the bear comic is because on the very front, there is a bear with a bowl of cereal. And the bear we find out is the mascot of this cereal Mm -hmm. that a little girl is eating at the very beginning of this issue. Mm Mm-hmm. And actually, as for a mini comic, this is quite substantive. I mean, there are a lot of pages sure. here, and and pages that have uh, twenty four panels in one page uh, because yeah. they're really <laughs> yeah. tiny panels at yeah. times. Yeah. yeah. 
So yeah, that that it, that <laughs> it makes sense that it's the bear icon because it's that iconography. It's that image of that bear who is like is the kind of thing where if you squint, it looks like oh, that's just a cute bear that's drawn for the the front package of a cereal box. You know, makes sense as like a Tony the Tiger type. But then when you actually look at it, and then it's sort of that that icon becomes the um, nightmarishly omnipresent thing throughout this book that haunts this kid uh it's a terrifying looking bear it has the creepiest smile and um these dead large but dead looking eyes that are like these it's the eyes that do yeah, it for me yeah that's what make it so damn scary yes, they're just huge and they f- and and fake looking uh mm-hmm. <laughs> that little trick that artists do where they draw a little reflection in the eye to make it look kind of watery and dehumanized eyes is you know this these eyes are devoid of that they're just these big black holes you know <laughs> <laughs> um and actually they are they are okay. black holes because in one two page splash we have just a two page splash of the bear like a whole you know various sized versions of the bear and they're crawling out of one of them's eyes it's, it's really creepy <laughs> it is Okay, so how would you describe the story? Hmm. Um, <laughs> besides a, a meditation on, I don't know, capitalist uh, production of, of uh, mm-hmm. imagery. You know, there's a, actually a little Felix the Cat clock, which is an interesting kind of little real-world comparison, right? Um, which also becomes scary by contrast. That's right, that's right. Or in comparison. In comparison, to, that's yeah. right. So basically, the kid is eating cereal. And uh, see, look, looking at the cereal box as we do when we eat cereal, and then all of a sudden this bear uh, sort of jumps out and starts uh, ter- the mascot. The, the mascot, cereal. that's right, starts terrorizing the kid, and then the terrors get um, deeper from there. <laughs> that's how I guess I would sum it up. Well, at first, it doesn't seem like the bear is going to be terrorizing because he comes mm. out, and even though he startles the little girl, he you know dances around, seems to be mm. happy. But then things get much more darker than that. And where they start to get darker for me is when, and this is, I think, on the third mm. page at the very bottom, mm. where the bear covers its eyes and then you turn mm. the page. And what happens is the bear's eyes seep through the bear's oh, hands. <laughs> That's right. And then looks at the girl. And now, if that sounds weird and surreal, that's basically yes. what the rest of the comic becomes. Yes. This exploration of various horrifying surrealities of of this bear image uh, in all these different ways that I can pop up. And, I, and what I like is the variety. It's like um, this is a study for of McFadzine, like all the bags of tricks of making something, you know, that puts potentially cute into something really creepy. And so those aforementioned 24 panel pages are just like this boom, 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 boom sequentiality of of like a lurking creepiness. And then there's other ones where, okay, let's go back to calm everyday life. And then it just gets real creepy with the bear somehow. Uh, so, um, yeah. 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 And, and it's not just the bear and the bear is the primary, I guess, uh, marketing icon, right, right. right. That, uh, terrorizes and really freaks out this little hmm. girl, but there at times other, icons that become frightening Mm. again you know by comparison Mm. so they may not be frightening but within the context of the bear and what the bear means to the girl they do become frightening so the girl becomes a little sensitive to cereal boxes and other kind of products with various supposedly happy innocent icons Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah um in uh issue five which we'll talk about next to know you're alive you know, um, he's, he's, he ha- attaches more words to the notion that, you know, he's experiencing a lot of these things in early fatherhood, you know, and, um, and so the sense when your kid is growing up and you sort of can't avoid that they live in this, um, very commercialized world of images that are targeted towards children that are, again, like uh, omnipresent and, and, and sometimes scary, frightening in, in how much they jam into your face. I feel like that becomes depicted into, into kind of a, a, a lightweight horror uh, story that happens here. And so I, I can relate to it. I can relate to that sense that like, oh my gosh, these characters are everywhere um, <laughs> and scary, you know. Right. Now, at about the very middle of this issue, we get a shift in time mm-hmm. where we see the little girl who has become a young mm-hmm. woman um, grown up and she 
gets up, she's having breakfast as she does at the very beginning of this book, but there's no cereal. There's just right. toast and coffee. Right. And so she washes her dishes. Then she goes to work and she works at some kind of coffee shop. And then a guy comes in and through the introduction of this guy coming in, he points out, I think a billboard right. with this, uh, scary yeah. bear. First, and like so a the commercial bear on, is, a, on a cell phone or something like that. Right. E yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a little video, mm -hmm. I think, uh, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. And so, uh, the bear is reintroduced into this woman's mm -hmm. life and she's still traumatized mm -hmm. by that mm -hmm. experience. Mm -hmm. You know, as a kid. Uh, and, and then at the very end of this issue, we shift back to her as a little girl yeah. again. Right. Right. Yeah. So I, I, I really like the arrangement of this mm. story. You know, the way that uh, McFadzine goes from early childhood to early adulthood and then back to childhood. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I didn't I didn't know if the future, the grown up one was sort of an actual time shift or this um again like if you're envisioning that this is a terror that the the father is imagining on their child it's also terrifying to imagine your child growing up and becoming an adult and ne never being able to free themselves from the haunting specter of this you know commercial um artifact but um i did think that real significant at the end that we come back to what's you know the bear and the cereal kind of resolves itself a little bit, but then the last image, the closing image is this tiny Felix, the cat clock again. <laughs> right? so maybe that, well, you know, I'm, I'm glad you raised a question mm. about that older, yeah. mm. you know, the, the, mm -hmm. little, the older right. little girl, right. you know, going to work and still being traumatized right. because I wondered if, you know, is, is, did this really happen? Oh, of course, none of this really <laughs> happens, of course, because it's so damn sure. surreal. Um, or was this kind of a yeah. dream or a fantasy yeah. that the little girl has? Because if you look at the first page after the adult scene, right? right? Uh, in that top panel, upper right or upper mm. left, and she, it's, it's almost as if she has a reaction from whatever yeah. it is that she's thinking yeah. about. I mean, we don't know what she's reacting sure. to. Um, and it's almost as if as a little girl, she's having this fantasy. Right. Will I still be traumatized when I'm right. adult? Right. Yes. Right. And then we come back to her as a little right. girl. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's weird. <laughs> it's great. It's a weird it's great. story. I like and it, again, but... if you could. It, yeah. Um, okay. So you want to look at issue number five of Last Mountain. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, I liked reading. I liked the fact that I got to read these two together because I think I would have walked away from four being like, that was like weird and haunting uh, and, and interesting, <laughs> certainly by on its own. But like five almost interprets four for you, you know, a little bit um, or, or ac That's it kind of point. retrospectively yeah. did for me. Again, the, the vantage point of a father looking over the kid's shoulder at media and, you know, these images and stuff. But yeah. And so basically what that's what you mm -hmm. have. You mm -hmm. have a father and son and uh the media. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> but also what what the father does as a stay-at-home father. That's right. That's right. And I think this and what that means that's to That's right. Him. This more more plainly I guess it could be autobiographical, right? I wonder, mm. I wonder, I'm gonna, next time I see Dakota, and I hope he'll be at SPX, I'll mm. ask him. Uh, if that's meant to be actually him. Uh, certainly it's a father, right, who's narrating um, himself a, and his experience of being at home. Uh, and he's, he does seem like an artist, which which was what su just suggested to me that uh, this might be McFadsey himself. But um, an artist staying at home with this kid and, you know, needing to entertain that two-year-old kid quite often with... Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood and them sort of watching Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood together and it becoming a soundtrack of calm as he is sitting next to his kid, and this is an experience I'm familiar with, um, staring at his phone and seeing all the horrors of, you know, the news in the world around him. And um, somehow Mr. Rogers, the show, manages to help him to find a centeredness and calm and to cope as well uh, until it doesn't. <laughs> because right. the kid has a tantrum and then they see a weird thing with a, a YouTube video of Mr. Rogers. And it, uh, it's the sort of really kind of jarring ending to this thing. Yeah. Yeah. Now, um, you were talking about Mr. Mm -hmm. Rogers. Uh, the father says that they had found a, uh, I guess, a YouTube right. channel. I guess it's a YouTube mm -hmm. channel. Um, Mr. Rogers fan dot TK. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
which he says at the very end is now gone. Mm-hmm. So, you know, if you go to look for that, apparently you can't find <laughs> it. But it was a collection of Mr. Roger episodes, not in chronological mm-hmm. order. Mm-hmm. And so you got to see some of the earlier, younger Mr. Rogers mm-hmm. mixed in one after interspersed with the older Mr. Rogers. And there were a couple of Mr. Rogers episodes that seem rather strange, if not downright, downright fright, frightening. Mm-hmm. There's one, like, for instance, in the very middle of this mini comic, uh, the father says, one day we came across an odd episode of Mr. Rogers neighborhood. I thought it was a lighting test or a dress rehearsal or something. It was 28 minutes of Mr. Rogers silently puttering around the set of his house. (laughs) My kid still watched it though. He didn't even fuss. (laughs) Yeah. I wondered about, um, if he, if Mick Fadzine drew this knowing that there's a little bit of a Roger Sance <laughs> Renaissance going on right now. There's a doc. I don't know if you heard about this, Derek, but there's a documentary about his life uh, and work called "Won't You Be Won't mm-hmm. You Be My Neighbor" that just came out, to, and and actually has been getting a really a, a lot of uh, critical attention. You know, some some rave reviews, as well as a book about Rogers. And both the movie and the book are are sort of celebrating in a time when nothing is pure and and every, all of our heroes are fallen. The, this idea that this this man in the show was actually you know, pretty earnest. Uh, I mean, very earnest, very thoroughgoingly earnest in um, just wanting something very positive and and a great alternative to all the noise and clamor on TV um, for kids, Uh, a a very safe um, space for kids to come back to where we watch him put on his socks or whatever. And I remember watching Mr. Rogers (laughs) as a kid just being like, this is so weird. What is this? Because of its ordinariness, because it was this old, old man, really, in fact, you know, old man puttering around his house or, or sometimes younger. And so I've actually gone back to try to find, cause uh, my daughter and I used to watch, um, as she still occasionally does Daniel Tiger's neighborhood, which is a sort of like modern day version, uh, in a, you know, computer animated with the tiger family and stuff like that. So that, that's the like modern day iteration of, of Mr. Rogers. But I wanted to explain to her and show her what this old show was like. Cause it's just so hard to explain it. So we went on YouTube looking for old Mr. Rogers episodes. And indeed you can only find Mr. Rogers online, uh, through these folks who just sort of post old recordings of TV shows, you know, of the TV show, just like this uh, issue talks about. And so I, I just say all that to say, I think that there is um, a very interesting way that this mini comic talks about how these old sources of media that were meant for cert- certain things get um, changed when they're put into this very crazy online space, you know, just as we get crazy news in these streams, these feeds that um, make the world come at us in a weird, different way. So even this old media, which was very tempered and very carefully crafted, comes at us in this weird way where we get these outtake videos that end up kind of shocking and horrifying our kids, you know. Um, so now you mentioned, you know, horrifying mm. kids. It's if the book Almost, not Mm. quite, but almost ends on this horrific Mm -hmm, note mm -hmm. um, with another one of these kind of strange, weird videos. Um, At this point in the Mm. story, and we're at the end of the mini comic, Mm. uh, the father (laughs) has just been experiencing, you know, his child having a tantrum and he ends up yelling at the child and then feels bad about that. So he sits on the floor and kind of tries to collect himself. But then all of a sudden, he's, I guess, awakened from his reveries by hearing his son yell, no, no, Papa, help. And what the kid had been watching is this video that is basically just, I guess, just a video of the darkened studio, Mm -hmm, the mm -hmm. set of Mr. Rogers. And the way that the father describes it, he says, there was something moving around the darkened set of Mr. Rogers' (laughs) house. I could hear faint, frantic whispering. Oh, man. That 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 made me yeah, yeah, and you imagine it's probably just like somehow they got video and it's the stage crew moving some things around the set or something like that. But yeah, for a kid, yeah. where that space is supposed to be, you know, this very sanitized and you know thing, it's just like it, that could be really really terrifying. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I really enjoyed these, and again, we highly recommend that if, if you, I mean, they're out of they're out of print or they're sold out. <laughs> but if you can find issues any issues of last mountain in particular these two the bear comic and to know you're alive last mountain number four and five get them absolutely 
in- introduce yourself to Dakota McFancy. Yeah, I think all kinds of folks would like them, but you, you can hear that I've been reading these from the perspective of a young dad, and those hit really close to home in terms of the existential mm-hmm. <laughs> qu- dilemmas of that this particular situation. Yeah, right. <laughs> Well, Paul, three really interesting and different texts that we looked at for this week. We started off with No Brow 10 Studio Dreams from No Brow Press, which not really a comic, but it's something that people should definitely mm-hmm. check out. Or just illustrations. After that, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. After that, we looked at Love and Rockets, Volume 4, Number 5. And then we wrapped up with the last two issues of Dakota McFadzine's Last Mountain. <laughs> To know you're alive. It's a good feeling to know you're alive, Derek. <laughs> yes. Yeah. To know you're alive is much more uplifting than the bear comic. Mm, yeah, yeah. 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 Bear comic is much more disturbing, but in a fun way. <laughs> they both have their own ways, uh, their own forms of creepiness. But uh... <laughs> That's right. And if you like creepy comics, the best way to get them is by How's That for a nice. Segway. Nicely done. Going to Discount Comic Book Service. They have non-creepy comics as well. Go to DCBService.com, and there you can be guaranteed to find incredible, unbeatable prices every single month. That's DCBService.com. And after you do get your comics there, get in touch with us and let us know what you're going to be reading. If you go to our website, ComicsAlternative.com, you'll find that you can leave us a voice message online via SpeakPipe. Or you can call us the old-fashioned way by picking up your phone and dialing 4153-COMICS. That's 415-326-6427. Another way you can get in touch with us is via the old email. Uh, we are two guys at ComicsAlternative.com for the podcast. Uh, Derek is Derek at ComicsAlternative.com, and I'm Paul at ComicsAlternative.com. Hey, listen, we love hearing from you. We sincerely do. And so uh, you keep us going. Let us know uh, what you enjoy, and if you, if you are reading something that you you should want us to check out. Yeah, we would just really great. It'd be really great to, to get some correspondence from y'all. True. Yeah. You can also correspond with us via social media. We have accounts on Twitter, Facebook, Tumblr, Instagram, Google Plus, Goodreads, Pinterest, YouTube, Slack, and Discord. You can subscribe to the podcast through Apple Podcasts. You can stream us on Stitcher. You can also find us on Spotify, on TuneIn, on iHeartRadio, and on Google Play Music. But you can find every single one of our podcast episodes, as well as the reviews and comics-related commentary that we post on our blog, simply by going to our website, comicsalternative.com. That's right. Thank you so much for listening, for following the podcast, for, um, yeah, for hanging around with us and reading comics with us. Mm, yes. And we will be back next week with more fun stuff. And I think that should be our preview show. Uh, getting close. If I'm not mistaken. <laughs> yes, it will be. Uh, so until then, I'm Derek. And I'm Paul. Take care.